basically saving the Galapagos, uh, or protecting the Ga Galapagos Wildlife de expedition. And it happened earlier this year, February and March of uh, 2019. This is the story. It's uh, we got the license, the call sign Hotel Delta Eight Mike, issued by the the government of Ecuador, which uh, owns the Galapagos, and we're on Santa Cruz Island in the Galapagos. These are the dates. Um, let me just say quickly that Mike Iman he put me onto a story in QST last fall, which talked about the expeditions and the costs per QSO and that sort of thing. We do calories per QSO. They do costs per QSO. So, um, but one of the things that this article talked about was it, it put uh, de expeditions into three groups. The first group was the ones, the places you can fly to. Then there was the places that you can't quite fly to, and then there was the places where you just can't get there. And that would include Bouvet Island and Peter the First, and and uh, places other places where people have never been before. Uh, this is a place you can fly to, and I'm going to show you all about that here in just a minute. So it was one of the the group, the largest group of de-expeditions are the places you can fly to. And that's what the Galapagos are. All right, so this is the group of people that met us when we arrived in the Galapagos. You probably know that the Galapagos are famous for wildlife, flora, and fauna. There are literally thousands of the unique species. One of them is the giant tortoise, and there are several different species of the giant tortoise. Depends on which island you're on. But obviously, these are not the people that met us at the airport. We have deer crossings in the U.S. They have tortoise crossings in the Galapagos. Yeah. All right, so we had been there only a short while when I ran into this guy, a relative of Lonesome George. He was uh, probably only about 100 years old, maybe uh, two feet high and three feet long. And uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but I have a video of him doing something here. Let me see if this will work. So what's this guy doing? Well, he's eating. And I thought, uh, when I saw this, I thought of the Vienna Wireless Society. <laughs> because we love to eat. And then you watch this guy, he's just stuffing it down, and that's what we do. Thanks to people like Ron and Mike and a few others. So this only lasts a few seconds. There you go, he's done. So let's talk about the de-expedition. What were the goals? Well, first of all, this was we were trying to raise money for the Galapagos Conservancy. It's a uh, nonprofit in the U.S. which uh, uh, does a lot of good work toward protecting the Galapagos wildlife, flora and fauna from uh, invasive species and a whole bunch of other stuff. So we wanted to help raise money for them. We also, obviously for ham radio purposes, wanted to make as many contacts as possible. We wanted to talk to unique stations as much as possible. Uh, atnos. Anybody here not know what an atno is? Oh, okay. An atno means all-time new one. So, for example, if you were, you'd never worked a station in the Galapagos and you worked H HDA mic, that's an all-time new one for you. And uh, I had a personal goal of working in as much as possible in the general portion of the bands to expand our, our de de uh, demographics, thank you, the number of people we could talk to. And then, of course, we were, we were also lucky. We got there just after the government of the of Ecuador allowed amateur operators to use the 60 meter band. So we were the first amateurs to use 60 meters from the Galapagos. And if you work us on 60 meters, good for you. And of course, I wanted to learn and have fun. What was our equipment like? Well, remember, this is a fly-in place. So thanks to AI4SV, I sh Jack, I should use your name. It's thanks to Jack, I had learned a little bit about taking stuff into another country. We had all kinds of documentation, and I had everything packed neatly, and they could open up my suitcase and look at the stuff in very neat order and all that stuff. Turns out they didn't even look. <laughs> and the reason for that is because of the crazy Irishman named Murphy who says if you're totally prepared for something, it won't happen. All right, so anyhow, we, but this is our state. We had to carry everything with us and promise to carry it out. So we, we decided we, we were going to be simple. We took two ICOM 7300s as rigs and all the equipment that goes with it, you know, power supply and all that sort of stuff. We carried four antennas, 160-meter dipole, the big, the big one, and then we had a G5 RV. We had a 40-meter off-center fed, 40-10-meter off-center fed dipole, and, of course, the 40-meter loop. And you'll see some of those here shortly. All right, here's the team. 
The whole team consisted of my friend Jim Milner, WB2REM, a retired psychologist, which turned out to be a very good thing. I needed help before this was over. And then, of course, me. Now, where are the Galapagos? In case you don't know, or in case you do know and need a refresher course, there they are, almost due south of New Orleans and almost due west of, uh, of uh, Quito, Ecuador, and they are right on the equator, or as close as you can get to the equator and still be on dry land in that area, about 600 miles out from uh, uh, Ecuador in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Now, how do you get there? Well, you fly. <laughs> but first, you can't get there from here. You have to go to Ecuador first. You have to go to Quito or to Guayaquil. And this is a screenshot of something my wife captured. She was following me. She wanted to make sure I was really going there and not somewhere else. You know. So here I am on Delta the flight, uh, whatever it was, on my way to uh, Quito. And as you can see there, uh, out of Atlanta, as you can see there, I was due to arrive at 11, 11 p.m. Now the flights go in there late at night and leave even later at night or earlier in the morning. And what that means is you cannot go directly to the Galapagos without passing go. You've got to go through Ecuador to get there. So, since we were in Quito, Jim, who knows everybody, knew a bunch of guys at the Quito Radio Club, QRC. So, it turns out that the day we were there, they were having their monthly luncheon. And I thought, being a wireless society, we're going to eat some more. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, we went there. And the first thing that happens, this is a terrible photo, but you can look and see those antennas. That's just about half the antennas that they have at their club. They have a physical club that includes... Um, uh, that 40 meter beam, you see that one up in the up upper left hand corner there. I should know how to do this. Yeah, that thing there. And they uh, these towers, there are about uh, four more towers plus a whole bunch of wire antennas. It's quite uh, an operation. And this is their this is just the lobby of their club, formed in 1933, uh, I think it says 33. So it's older than our club. They have this, this room right here, that's the president's office. There's an even bigger room right over here for the secretary. Where's Mike? Man, you would have loved it. Yeah, we need one. Anyhow, so, uh, and, and it's too bad about the lights. Maybe somebody could turn off the front, the front of the room lights back there because I'd like you to see a little bit more of this. I, I should have shown more photos of this, but I just wanted you to know that there's right through there is a conference room and a lecture hall. Just off to the right here is a reception area. Uh, just off to the left is the secretary's office. If you go down the stairs there, you go into a, a room that's a combination of a dining hall with a separate kitchen, a recreation room with four pool tables and a snooker table, and just off to the, in the corner back in that way is the radio room. <laughs> the radio club has a radio room, and it's, it's a room wall to wall with, uh, with rigs so they can operate from those antennas. Now, this club was as friendly a club as we are. They're really, really cool folks. And, of course, they managed to speak English because Jim's Spanish was mediocre and mine was non-existent. All right, so, anyhow, we left Quito after having all this fun there, and we took off on our transportation on the way over to the uh, Galapagos, and this was our transportation. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's the, uh, that's the HMS Beagle. That's Darwin's transportation. You know, he went there before us. And uh, that's, that's a painting of the HMS Beagle. Anyhow, uh, here's, where, here's where we were headed. If you look right here in the middle, you can see Santa Cruz Island, the biggest city in the Galapagos, Puerto Ayora. And this place right here says Baltra Island. You can't read it, but that little airplane is the airport. Why is there an airport there? Well, the United States Army Air Corps in World War II built an air base there because they were worried about s people sneaking in from down, down there. And when the uh, war was over, they gave it to the Galapagos, and they were smart. They held on to it. They improved it over the years. They lengthened the runway, and it's quite a nice airport when you consider that that's the only thing on that island. So, uh, by the way, we were right here. This is a volcano, and we were about right here on the side of the volcano. You'll see it in a minute. Sorry? Uh, not at the moment, but who knows? Um, uh, oh, they, oh, yeah, I should say that. There's an airport there which is rarely used on San Cristobal. There, on Cristobal. Anyhow, uh, I was going to go on and on about this, but I did want to tell you this. The, these islands are all volcanic. They're very young. They're only one to three million years old. There's a 
the hole in the Earth's crust right there, which blows up a volcano and creates an island every every million years or so. And uh, so just remember that because this, this is going to come into play shortly. So anyhow, so what happens is you fly from Quito or Guayaquil or both out to Baltar there, and you get off the plane, and you got to get over to Santa Cruz. And how do you do that? Well, you take a ferry across the channel. And that's, this is what it looks like. There are a whole bunch of independent ferry operators. It costs one dollar to ride across that channel. But they make sure they get their dollar. They don't, they don't pull into port on the other side until everybody's paid. All right, so we, we got out there, and our guy met us and took us off to our quarters. And these are our quarters. Oh, wait a minute. This is the Falkland Island. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong island. This is our quarters. And this is a close-up of it. That's the, build, that's the Airbnb that Jim found, and we were able to set up up there. And as you can see, it's on the slope. It's on the, almost at the top, but not quite at the top of that volcano, which is good, except for the fact that all this beautiful grass here is on top of rocky volcanic ground. Well, that's a problem because it fooled me initially until I found out about it because I was the guy who was putting up the antennas. So I was crawling around in this stuff or walking around in this stuff. And then, of course, we found out that we could prove that volcanic ground is not really good for HF transmission. You probably knew that. So we had that was our first problem. The grounding is no good. The second problem was propagation was no good. And third problem was we had 100 watts in a wire. But we still managed to, to work. OK. Oops, wrong button. So there's always the mandatory picture of the entire team. And there we are. I'm the tall guy. And this is the, one of the entrances to that uh, Airbnb uh, place where we were staying and operating. And inside there, we found a beautiful setup. There was a picnic table. We threw our stuff out on the bench, wired everything up. Looks were not important. Pete would be upset. We, didn't, we weren't neat at all. We wanted to get on the air. So he was throwing that stuff together while I was outside throwing the arborist raid over the limbs to get the antennas up. And there's Jim working CW. Now, this guy could work 30, 35 words a minute for one to two hours at a time without the computer. He would just wail. I have never seen anything like it. So he, was, he, he would fit nicely when, in this club with a few of our CW operators. When he got tired, he'd let the computer work for him, but he, he used that paddle. And if you work CW, to, if you worked us on CW, you, you talked to Jim. Oops, wrong, wrong button again. And there's the second mandatory picture, the, t the team hard at work, the entire team hard at work. Okay, and that's the view we had sitting at that table where we, you just saw us. And that's the Pacific Ocean right out there. Nope, that's just another island. That's Santa Fe Island. So you can see, the, you can see part of the 160-meter dipole right there. And uh, the reason this is, uh, one of the reasons this picture is interesting is because you can see we did have a little bit of altitude, which helped. It helped a lot. And then this is sunrise over the Pacific. So, because we didn't sleep much, we were up, you know, working, trying to find you guys. This is the other side of the house, and you can see the G G5 RV is it right there, going that way. And you can't see it in this picture, but there's a 40-meter loop, which we, which we could hardly get off the ground. But it worked beautifully on, on 40 meters. No, this is, this is gravel. This is dark volcanic gravel. It looks, does look like water, but it's not. This is the road that leads up to the, to the place. All right, so here's the 100 meter, 160 meter dipole. This end over here was tied to one end of the corner of the house. The other end, even though it doesn't look like much, is about uh, two thirds of the way up this tree. Because that's as high as I could heave that arborist rate weight. I, I was afraid to take a slingshot. Jack, would I have been able to get a slingshot through there if they looked? Who knows? Anyhow, so that's the 160 meter dipole and the 80 and the 80 10 meter whatever it was Z5 RV. Down here we had an you can't see it, but we had another uh, dipole, the off center fed 40 meter one, and I told you about the uh, loop. All right, so very quickly getting on. Um, because, by the way, I should, say, should have said this up front. What I really am interested in is what are your questions? Because I'm just blithering on here, just showing you some stuff. But I'd really like to know what you would like to know about what it's like to be on a D-Expedition. So anyhow, we used a lot of FTA. You'll see some statistics here shortly. 
And what I wanted to show you was this is what happened in a regular FTA. We would we would fire up on a, on in this case it was on 15 meters, and we fired up the rig and we called CQ. And about two to three minutes later, this is what it looked like: solid red. All these people are calling us. Once that happened, we would then try to send a little brief message saying, "Go Foxhound and give them a frequency," and we would shift over to Foxhound. Anybody here? Is there anybody here who does it? Who has never worked FT8? It's got to be a couple of people. Okay, forgive me for blithering through this then, because I'm just going to try and talk quickly about it. But there's the FT8 is a, a digital mode, and uh, there is a uh, a more modern version of it that allows you to do co uh, quick exchanges for the expedition type uh, events. All right, so this is regular FT8, and you can see everything's red. That means people are calling us. For those of you who are not familiar with it. And then we switched over to Fox Hound. Now, in this case, it happened to be a different time when I took this picture, and this was obviously on 40 meters. This is what it looks like on the other end. I had no idea, but this is what it looks like on the other end. So if you are a hound and you call us you, and you do it in the appropriate frequency range, which is above 1,000 hertz, you will end up up here in this list until it gets full and it was, just won't take anymore. And what we did was we would then move you down here into this square which is the Q and then Joe Taylor so smart FT8 does everything else for you because what FT8 would do is it would then call these stations one at a time we already have um, uh, signal uh, signal report signal strength and it would call you with a signal uh, strength and if you called back then FT8 would simply say RR73 and that's the end of it there's no more conversation so they they could go like that. And in fact, Fox Hound mode allows you as a fox to work more than one station at once. Here's a case, ex for example, somebody said this was K5RJ, which is Ray Johnson, the first president of this club, but it turns out I was wrong. It's K5LJ. Anyhow, this, this transmission and one transmission in less than 15 seconds, we confirmed with K5LJ, VE3, FXL, and this KW or K4WCL. Uh, we confirmed these two, see the two RR73s, and, and we told this guy a signal strength report. And if he came back to us within three transmissions, if, uh, the Fox will only try three times to get a signal report ba back from you. After that, you, you disappear and you got to go back over here and start, you know, you, you pass go and don't collect $200. There's a question over there. Yes, sir. Oh, like that at something like field day? Because we were just doing manual. Like the normal no, no. But by next year, year, there will be, I'm sure, a field day mode. But no, not that. Yeah, well, next year there's probably going to be FT4, FT4, but that's a whole other conversation. So uh, uh, don't want to cut you short, but I know people are going to want to have a business meeting because they love business meetings so much. All right, so that's that's what Foxhound looks like uh, from to the Fox. All right, lessons learned. First lesson, story, the fuse story. All right, so imagine yourself sitting there. It's an afternoon. My, my colleague, Jim, was exhausted, and he went to take a quick nap. I'm sitting there with my computer running FT8 in Fox Hound mode, so I've got a, a, quite a, a little bit of time where I don't have to do anything because Joe Taylor's going to do it all for me. So I decide I'm going to do multitask, and I fire up his rig to run some sideband. I get it all ready to go. I hit the, the stop the talk switch. Boom, it goes dead. Oh, man, I thought it had broken everything. Long story short, what happened was one of the fuses in the line between the power supply and the rig had blown. It's a standard old-style automobile, slow-blow 15-amp fuse. But guess what? We're up on the mountainside in the Galapagos. What are we going to do? And it turns out our savior was the guy that was our driver, our guide, our maintenance guy. He showed up just in time to take Jim down to town just before the only auto parts store in the whole of the Galapagos closed. And he got some of those fuses, and we got back in action. All right, so that's the fuse story. I could elaborate, but I'm trying to go quickly here. Then there's the headset story. So me, I'm smart. I, six months before we go, I buy a headset just for this, this the expedition. And I check it out. I plug it in. I work some stations. I use it on the net on Thursday nights, a 10-meter net. Everything's working fine. I take it apart pack it up and get it ready to go don't touch it again until I'm setting up in the Galapagos when I find out it won't work why because I brought the adapter for a different radio not for the 7300 so now I have a headset that won't work fortunately 
I had a backup, but the backup was pretty crappy. Jim had another backup, so we were able to operate, but headset story. So two, two lessons learned. First of all, you can't take enough spare parts. Second lesson learned, before you go, check everything out just two days before you go and then pack it up. Make sure it works and then pack it up. Don't do it six months ahead of time and pack it up. All right, another story. Uh, pileups are really something. So I think I'm cool, right? I'm going to go down there. I'm going to work these sideband pileups. I'm going to work the weak signals. I'm going to do a great job. I'm going to be pulling people out and everything. No way. I get down there, and the pileups are so massive to me that I'm lucky if I can pull the guy that's running 5,000 watts and the beam out of the mess. And that's what we did. And I learned that in spite of my best intentions to work everybody in the weak stations, and it was going so fast, it was so intense, that I didn't even, I forgot I was going to say, all right, I want everybody to stop. If you're working more than 100 watts, don't call. Only the 100 watt stations. And you know what happens if you do that at hams. About half of the 5,000 watt guys won't transmit, but the other half will. So anyhow, pileups are really something. I could go on on about those if you want to hear more later. Uh, plans are just for fun. So I was really smart. I was going to, I was, I was going to uh, figure out our antenna plan before we went down there. I had a, I drew up a, a really nice looking thing that that my my graphics uh, instructor in college would have loved. Uh, this beautiful antenna plan, based on what we knew about what this place was like. Got down there, we look around, and absolutely none of what I decided I drew up was going to work. So I had, we just had to throw the antennas up the best way we could. And that resulted, unfortunately, in so instead of a couple of them being exactly 90 degrees to each other, most of them were sort of parallel to each other, and that meant some interstation interference and interband interference. But we worked through it anyway. The tools you take are not the ones that you're going to need. This guy Murphy is everywhere. So we did not. Well, I took, for example, I had soldering irons. I had every kind of tool you can imagine, except something to maybe make a fuse, a fake fuse. We didn't have that. No materials for that. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but anyhow, every we took all kinds of stuff that we didn't need. And uh, the expeditions to warm places are really good. I had, I had before I went, I watched a couple of DVDs that uh, I think Harry loaned me of, of the Peter the First Island the uh, expedition, and maybe one to the uh, the other ones to Bouvet a couple of centuries ago. And, and I thought, as well, I'm sitting there, and we're surrounded by insects and moths and little worms and stuff and everything, but I'm sitting there in T-shirt, 80 degrees, and we got a kitchen right there, and I'm thinking about those guys who are sitting on frozen guano in a tent, and they're eating sea rats. <laughs> so I thought, well, the expeditions to warm places are good. All right, so the results. We d were able to raise over $2,300 now. It says 2000 but... Uh, it's over $2,300 now that we've raised for the Galapagos Conservancy, and part of that is because there were some very generous people in this club who made donations. Thank you. We made over 8,100 contacts in actually about six, maybe six and a half days to 4,400 unique stations. Um, we worked 119 DXCC entities, and we also worked 49 states. The cost per QSO, the cost per QSO was, where's Mike? Here's Mike over there. The cost per QSO was a little less than a dollar. The cost per unique station was a little bit more than a dollar because we worked a lot of unique stations. Over half our contacts were on FT8. And uh, another result was that uh, I learned a new appreciation for the people that go to all the effort it takes to, to, to put on a D expedition. Even this one where we could fly in, we took all our stuff, but we didn't have to use helicopters. It's still appreciated because it was a lot of effort. It was... It was at times exhausting, and carrying all that stuff, even though it wasn't much, uh, was was a big job from time to time. Uh, let me think about that. I'm going to get. I had. Oh no, no. It was. It it was probably 100 pounds total between the two bags, 50 pounds each. Montana. Why weren't you guys out in Montana calling us? <laughs> I don't know, but we couldn't get Montana. We did work Alaska, Hawaii, but we didn't work Montana. All right, gratitude. Before I finish, I take some questions. Let me just say this. I want to say thanks to several people. One of them is WA6YOU who, who put together all the cables and all the jumpers that we used. Everything worked beautifully. Everything came back, and it was it's still beautiful. In fact, W4DDT is using them now again. 
Uh, also, thanks to RF Connection, Joel, because when I went up there begging, saying I needed some stuff for a D expedition, he gave it to me at a discount. I don't know how much it was, but he gave he gave me the coax and the connectors and all that stuff that Ron used to uh, help us out uh, at a discount. And then, of course, I want to say thank you to Jim W two uh, WB two REM, uh, who was so kind to me and um, put up with a lot of crap for me because I thought I was so smart. Remember that I thought I was so smart. And uh, Jim had been on these the expeditions many times, and thank God he was there. But I really owe him a, a debt of gratitude. And of course, I want to thank the Galapagos Conservancy for all the work they're doing so that we could see those turtles, those tortoises. And I want to say thank you to all of you as well, because I got a lot of support from the Vienna Wireless Society. And of course, I want to say thanks to my wife. She didn't even know I put that up there, but I want to say thank you to her for letting me go. All right, questions? Whoa, back, back there. there. So what's the electricity? Was that 110 down there, or did you have to bring adapters? Another beautiful question. Guess what? It's 115 volts, 60 cycles, U.S. plugs. Doesn't get any easier. Yeah, I don't, I hate, I'm embarrassed to admit that. Mike, you had a question? Yeah, what's the uh, Internet connection like? Uh, we did not have an Internet connection. How, how did we do FT8? You don't need an internet to do FT8. We use the radio. <laughs> FT8 doesn't require in an internet. It does require an internet to get the software set up. It does. Oh, the order. Oh, good point. The timing. You know what? That was a really big issue because obviously by the time we got there, right, neither one of our computers had been on for a couple of days. And as the days went on, our, our delta T, you know, time difference got bigger and bigger and bigger. But Jim was smart. He had this little uh, program on his computer called Time Fudge. And so what we did was about twice a day, we would set our clocks and our computers to match everybody else's signal. <laughs> so the world was our time clock, and we just manually adjusted it. But that's a great question. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. More questions? Over oh, here. You were running, you were running two, uh, 730, uh, 7300, sorry. Um, did you have much on the... Do you have much in the way of problems with interference between the two 7300s or not? A little bit. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, discombobulating or overwhelming. But I think a bigger problem we had was the fact that my beautiful antenna plan we couldn't use. So uh, we had too many, too many antennas that were too close to being parallel to each other. Dipoles we had. So we had... If you count the G5RV as a sort of a dipole, we had three dipoles that were not exactly parallel, but too close to being parallel. And that was a bigger problem than the interference. The, the front end, Lee's here, I suspect, and he will tell you the front end of the 7300. Great radio, but it's, it, it could use a better front end. And uh, I, I'm sure that didn't help either. But we managed to get through it. Harry. Why did you take so many antennas? Why didn't you just take two, for example? One Great question, and the answer is that Jim wanted to take more than one antenna, and I didn't know what I was doing, so I said, okay. Now, we, the 160 dipole was not going to be very helpful at 15 meters, we didn't think, you know, and, and 20 meters. So, but, he, but we had a lot of people that, he knows the hams all the world, and they were hitting him up hard before we left, saying, we want to work the Galapagos on 160. So please take a 160 meter and, uh antenna. So that one was essentially for top band. Uh, we used the G5R fee for 80 meters and we used that off-center fed dipole and the 40 meter loop for 40. The G5R fee and the off-center fed dipole did well on other bands too like 20 and 15. So it was a good, you know, we we took them because Jim wanted to and it turned out to be a good idea but that's a great question. There's a question back here. Uh, uh, hang on Mike, go ahead. So were the antennas interfering passively or only when you were transmitting? Well, what do you think? Well, I mean, were you, if you have five antennas and you only have two radios. Oh, that's what you're saying. No, they would, uh, when, one trans, when one station was transmitting, it, we, it would interfere with the other one, depending on which antenna we had and what band. Yep. An antenna that wouldn't be interfered with? We tried it. We could find one that would minimally interfere. Minimally interfere. Mike, CDN. Yeah. You talked about people wanting to get you on 160. How was your success on 160 and compared to like 80 and some of the other bands? What was your money band and did you get 160 uh, contacts? Good, good question. Yes, we got a lot of 160 contacts 
Got uh, Jim worked a lot of CW on 160. We did work some sideband on 160. Uh, but there was more. There was more CW. Uh, I, I don't remember us working any FT8 on 160. Uh, the money band was 20. Surprise. 15. We saw that one. Excuse me. Especially on FT8. And uh, 40, depending on what time of day it was. So what you'd expect. 40, 20, 15, depending on what time of day it was. And again, we we were there over the uh, the um, weekend of the AWRL DX contest. And what we found out was, in addition to the things like rocky ground, 100 watts in a wire, um, poor propagation, and all these de-expeditions that were out there or de-stations that were out there using beams and 5,000 watts or whatever, were, it was really hard. But we still worked 8,100, whatever I said, 8,100 uh, contacts in six days. So we did all right. Um, but... There were times when, for example, we'd, I'd be working sideband during the contest, just working as hard as I could go, and we'd take a quick break and come back, and our frequency was gone, and we couldn't find a frequency. Or, or if we did, nobody seemed to come back to us for a while because they couldn't hear us over all the, all the competition. That's a good question, though. Uh, what other questions do I have before we get into a regular meeting and stop this? Does, oh, PBI, you have another question. Where do you want to go next? Uh, good question. Well... <laughs> This, this, uh, this at least fulfilled the bucket list. So I don't need to do another one. But if I were going to do another one, I would go to a warm place, and I would go to a place that I could get to. Uh, if there, there's a, there's a place off the coast of um, Nicaragua called Rotoru. Thank you. Say it again. Rotuna. Uh, where apparently you c there's a station already set up there for people to come in and run de-expeditions. So I've now become the lazy de-expeditioner. De I should write a column like that. But other than that, no, I, you know, I want to go out to Burke Lake Park for my next de-expedition. There's a question over here. Tell us about the Japanese pilots. Or the Japanese pilots. So, um, no, this one. So one morning, actually two mornings, we got, you know, we got up. We did sleep a little bit. We didn't sleep a whole lot. But we, one morning, I got up and fired up this rig, and this window here was filled with Japanese stations on FT8 Foxhound. And it stayed that way for hours. It's as though, for some reason, the rig would not copy a station unless it was Japanese. It was just flipping amazing. And... When it started to change, what happened was we would get Chinese stations in here mixed with the Japanese. So for me, the, by the way, I'll just say this real quickly. Um, this was a delight because personally at my station at home, I've never worked China. I've rarely worked Japan and not worked Taipei. We did that. Uh, didn't work Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand. Um, uh, um, worked Antarctica there. And uh, there's a few other places I can't remember. So from HCA Mike, from the Galapagos, I've worked a whole bunch of stations that I <laughs> may never work until the sunspots come back for my station or until I get the beam up. Uh, Pre-publicity, uh, letting people know you're going to be there that day, those days and all that? Good question. Yes, we were on the, the, uh, the web page. is called Announce De-Expeditions. It's the page to go to if you want to track the expeditions And we were on that. We were in... Radcom, the Ro the Radio Society of Great Britain. It was thanks to to Ron, I got a copy of the their magazine that announced us, including our call signs and names, saying we're going to be there. We were uh, listed in QST, I think, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, we did have publicity. We did have publicity. If people want to know about us, and J like I said, Jim knows everybody. He's amazing. You, do all, don't you guys all know Jim? You must have worked him at one time or another. But anyhow, he he had. He had publicity out everywhere. Um, all right, real quick, I'll show you a couple of things, and then I'll shut up and we'll go into a meeting. I wanted to show you, take a look at, uh, during the social hour, take a look at this map and you get a better feel for what the Galapagos are like. One of the things I didn't point out on that map is this is the equator right here. I should put it up there. But we were essentially just that far south of the equator, and you think about what that means for radio propagation. There will be a quiz on that later. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is I wanted to say that if you if you worked us and you want a QSL card and you didn't get one, let me know. 
I'll look you up, and if you if you're in our log, I'll get you, I'll make sure you get one. I have some blank ones. Uh, if you worked us and you want a QSL card and you want to be really nice, you can still go on the club log, request a QSL card there, which is going to cost you some money, but a portion of that, I think a dollar for every request, goes to the conservancy. So that's how can we raise some money. And again, I, I don't want to mention any names, but there were there was more than one member of this club who was very generous and gave a donation of a sizable amount to the Conservancy in, in relation to HD8 Mike. Okay, well, this, thank you all for listening. It's been a lot of fun for me to talk about this. If you have other questions, let me know. Maybe we could get the lights on and we could go straight into a business meeting so we can get to the important part, which is food.